Well, welcome to the 25th session of Progenesis Academy webinar series. Today's topic is minimal stimulation pros and cons. We are very pleased to have a great panel of fertility experts. We have with us Dr. Ding. She is a physician at Stanford University. Dr. Kamon from the Fertility Institute of Hawaii. Dr. Escobar from TC Fertility Center and Dr. Yilin from, from Live IVF Center. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, well, you guys know today's topic is low stimulation. And I want us to start my first question by asking you guys to define low stimulation for us according to your uh, you know, IVF treatments and your, your particular protocol. And I will start um, this with uh, Dr. Kamon. So I think that that's, uh, that's the toughest question to answer because um, the literature doesn't really define per se minimal stimulation. I think um, some studies look at completely natural cycles, right? Um, with no stimulation, other studies are looking at um, comparing clomid um, to, to uh, conventional insemination or clomid plus low-dose gonadotropins. Um, I think some studies are looking at um, uh, doses of 150 units daily and lower as minimal stimulation. So I think that's one of the issues um, when we try and compare success rates among various uh, studies. Thank you so much. So it's really hard to uh, be able to compare all those scenes because each one is different, according right. to what you're saying. Very good. Uh, Dr. Deng, what's your perspective? Yeah, uh, I would agree with Dr. Carmen. I think like uh, typically if we say we stimulate the patient with the pills only like Clomid or Latrozole uh, with or without combination of uh, HMG or FSH, uh, with the daily dose 175 to 150, typically less than 150 units per day. Now we say it's a, a minimal stimulation compared with conventional IVF, where typically patients get a higher or like full dose uh, 450 or 600 units per day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Escobar? So, you know, uh, it I completely agree. Uh, when when a patient comes asking for mini stim IVF, the first thing I tell them is, "Well, this is what I call mini stim IVF because there's no consensus whatsoever." And I just want to make sure we're all clear with the patient because obviously they've been reading something elsewhere, you know. And so, but for for us, um, what I would consider in my practice mini level stimulation is is when I'm using something besides like clomid or letrozole for stimulation, whether I add gonadotropins or not. So if I'm, if I'm treating a PCOS patient with 175 IUs of FSH, I wouldn't call that minimal stimulation. That's just IVF. Very good. Thank you so much. Dr. Yelian? Yes, I agree with uh, the panel discussion of the uh, definition, but uh, uh, at this point, I don't think I have a uh, clear definition, what is a minimum stimulation uh, IVF? And I think uh, uh, all the different doctors and the different centers, they have their own definition. So, but I think uh, uh, the minimum stimulation has, uh, uh, so in general, is uh, lower than a normal amount of uh, gonadotropin shopping give to each patient. So in our uh, clinic, and uh, so we have a two different category and for minimum stimulation. and. Uh, uh, first category is uh, uh, patients just taking the uh, oral me medication. And uh, for example, uh, taking clomiphen and uh, lechazole or tamoxifen. So those are the pills can be as uh, solely uh, medic pills. And this is uh, one of the lowest level of stimulation. And on uh, second category is uh, uh, pill plus a few injections and uh, uh, very low dose in the 75, uh, 150 uh, in the daily or every other day. So those are the to uh, category uh, in my standard, we clarify all those is considered minimum stimulation as two categories. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, the next question is, what kind of patients are suitable for Lostin protocol? Uh, Dr. Kamon. Uh, so I think it depends on um, how you view this. Okay, so um, for somebody who has uh, an excellent prognosis, um, 
somebody who has, you know, and, and when I say excellent prognosis, I mean um, very good ovarian reserve, you know, they have a great antral follicle count, good AMH. Um, we do see that um, giving them conventional dosing, of, they do very well with, with conventional uh, IVF. Um, we, we expect to get lots of eggs from them. Um, however, they may, not, they may not need all those eggs. They may not need all those embryos. Okay, so for those patients, um, especially for those patients who you know, are paying out of pocket for medications or IVF in places where there's no insurance mandate, et cetera, it may make sense to um, kind of tailor the dosing for them, provide them with lower dose stimulation because maybe all they need is a few eggs. Okay, maybe all they need is a few embryos. Um, I think that there are good data suggesting that the more eggs you get uh, safely from these good prognosis patients, typically the cumulative pregnancy rate is going to be higher. Um, so overall, if they have more embryos, um, they are going to be more likely to, to have a baby. Um, and so the patients need to understand that. But on the other hand, uh, you know, we're not trying to create armies of children for anybody. And so it's very especially from kind of a cost effectiveness point of view for somebody who has an excellent prognosis to consider lower dose stimulation. On the other hand, um, there, I think the majority of the literature is looking at minimal stimulation in uh, poor responders. At least that's, that's the way that I see it. And that's a whole, I mean, I think we can definitely spend hours talking about the, you know, the benefits and downsides to doing minimal stimulation in low responders. So I'll just start out by saying that it really, uh, are responders, you know, are they candidates for minimal stimulation? I think some of us will say yes, and some of us will say no. Um, I think that, you know, there are data suggesting that um, some of those patients are going to uh, do better if you kind of give them um, perhaps a few cycles with, uh, with less medication, um, but there are other data that, that suggests that that's not the case. In addition, I think um, now that we're mainly doing frozen embryo transfers, at least my center is, we don't have to worry as much about the impact of gonadotropin dosing on the endometrium. Um, so I think that that is something to, to also consider whether the patient is doing fresh or frozen. Uh, and then lastly, I do want to point out a very important point, which is that many patients will respond, many poor responders will respond the same way whether I give them very high doses of Medicaid or low doses. So if I give them 450 units or 600 units, you know, maybe some of these patients will just make two eggs, uh, mature two eggs, um, and it's going to cost a whole lot more money for them than if I give them um, a much lower dose of medication. In that case, they still may just make those same you know, two eggs. Um, and so I think I'll just stop talking now and open it up to everybody else, but there, there's a lot more to discuss about the, the simulation protocols for lenders, I think. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Deng, what's your perspective? Yeah, uh, I would agree. I, I don't think there's a, such a single stimulation protocol that would fit everyone. Uh, and when we are deciding whether we should use a minimal stimulation versus conventional, we take into account uh, many parameters of the, for example, patient's age, ovarian reserve, what's her response to prior uh, stimulation protocol, what's her fertilization rate, blastocyst formation rate, and also what's the outcome, what's her goal of her family size? Does she want only one child or like uh, two or three children? And then we take a look at the whole picture and uh, to find out, okay, what could be the best potential stimulation protocol for that specific individual? And I agree with Dr. Carmen, many, actually there are fair uh, good evidence supporting using the minimal stimulation in poor, over, uh, poor responders or diminished ovarian reserve patient because we know um, the number of uh, X we can potentially achieve uh, actually is probably determined by how many andrew follicles this patient has at the beginning of her menstrual cycle and uh, in that specific month. And uh, for those support responders or diminished ovarian reserve patients, oftentimes they just don't respond to exogenous gonadotropin that well. No matter how much medication we give to them, they probably have only three or four follicles and that's the maximum number of eggs they can get in that cycle. 
And uh, since uh, this is going to be uh, the number of eggs they can get, uh, why we're spending so much money on the medication if we can achieve that number of eggs by just giving patient clomid or latrozole or a lower um, amount of gonadotropins. And uh, I think ASRM has released a committee opinion back in 2018 and stated that for poor risk mono patient, stim minimal stimulation should be considered uh, uh, um, because of the comparable clinical outcome, lower cost, better tolerance. And uh, I do think those patients could potentially benefit from minimal stimulation. Uh, and also there's some data, uh, data actually supporting for overweight uh, patient with high BMIs, uh, they might respond better to the minimal stimulation uh, protocol instead of like a, you give a really high dose and keep pushing uh, those of follicular growth. Uh, I think, um, and in nowadays, I know like many centers, they actually apply minimal stimulation to even normal ovarian uh, reserve patient or PCOS patient uh, if they want to have only limited number of embryos. As Dr. Carmen mentioned, they probably don't need to like 20 or 30 eggs to produce like 10 or 12 embryos to get them pregnant. Um, so that's typically uh, what we uh, would consider. Uh, I know Dr. Uh, Yelian and Dr. Escobar, they have uh, a lot of experience in treating these patients and uh, I'm gonna uh, open this up to them. Very good, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Dr. Escobar? So, yeah, just like they mentioned before, there's, uh, there's it's, so many people call Ministim for so many different reasons. Um, there's also people who just wanna do it because they feel it's more natural. Um, there's patients that come because they think it's cheaper, um, and I do agree on that. However, there are patients that just are blessed with a lot of eggs. They have an under on 18 or 20, so I have to explain to them, listen, if I do this, I'm going to maybe take five or seven eggs when you can easily produce a lot more. So really, my practice, I feel the patients that really benefit from um, are patients with diminished ovarian reserve, um, and the strategy is the treatment is really the same. The variance in cost is really going to be the medication. So if I feel that a patient, the first thing I ask is what do you, what, what, what family do you want? What's the family that you want to build? What's your dream, your, your dream family? And for people, it's just doing an IVF cycle, whether it's stocking that. For a lot of people, some people are like, you know, I'd like to have a child, but ideally this. And for some people, gender is part of the mix. And so I kind of use my charts and just kind of show them, well, this is what I would expect, the euploidy rate or the pregnancy rate per your age, and then look, let's look at your antifocal count and your AMH level and how many eggs I think we can get and how many embryos that's gonna result in and so forth. And we build your family like that. So I want them to understand whether they are good responders or put responders. Basically, is an IVF cycle gonna build a family they want, especially during their late 30s, early 40s, or should they expect multiple cycles? And if they expect multiple cycles, then I kind of tend to see a lot of those patients as mini steam patients. So really, all the patients with diminished ovarian reserve is classically what I see as a mini steam patient. And then the dosing, I will vary it a little bit based a lot, based on how many eggs I see. So if someone has an antifocal count of two, it doesn't matter if I give her $7,000 worth of medication or 2,000, I'm just gonna get two eggs. Um, if she has an antifocal of seven, but maybe she wants two children, then maybe I'm gonna say, you know what? Normally I do 150 IUs of gonotropins. In your case, I'll give you the clomid and that amount of gonotropins, but a little bit more gonotropins because I wanna squeeze out a couple more eggs, you know? So, and, and I keep it flexible and I will titrate it as we go forward. And sometimes I will extend the stimulation protocol. So these are patients that I really have to get to know. I also bring them over several menstrual cycles and try to figure out what's the normal egg reserve for adrofogal hunt for that patient. Because we'll see a patient may have AFC of four and the next month maybe eight. So obviously I don't want to just give her OCPs and bring her back. And then and then go oh my and then you start her and then she's got three or four antifocals when I know she can do better so I think we go over all that kind of trying to define 
you know, what, what, what's the patient that, that, that normally would offer this will benefit from it. And um, we do freeze all. Uh, most of my patients do PGS. Uh, just all commerce is like 70% in these uh, patients is going to be higher. And I think it's extremely helpful to, to then put PGS or PDTA or genetic testing of the embryos into the mix because that's really what's going to help me determine if they need to do a second or a third cycle because then they have something tangible to base on their next decision. So for me, in the last few years, really is, is thinking, okay, you're a diminished of reserve, you need multiple cycles, Therefore, we have this package that is cheaper for you as treatment goes, plus your medication is going to be a lot cheaper. I do think that PGS is very helpful for those patients. Um, and, 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 and so that, that's kind of, kind of the, uh, the strategy that we take. But, but I, as we've discussed before, you know, in, in just a completely, in another practice, it may just be something completely different. But that, that's kind of what we do. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Yelian? Uh, first of all, I agree. And uh, uh, I think uh, the, all the panels uh, mentioned about the for patients with the uh, uh, diminished ovarian reserve. And uh, so certainly, these are uh, the good candidates for using uh, minimum stimulation because uh, those individuals, no matter how much medication you give, and uh, so have very poor response and they don't have uh, much uh, metabolic growth. And the second category, this is a patient with PCOS, and so you don't want those patients to overstimulate. And so using minimum stimulation is a very good option for those individuals, especially for young patients. So on top of these two categories, so I think there's another three category patients also suitable for that minimum stimulation idea. One is that a patient is young patients, and they just have a tubal disease, or have male factor infertility. So those individual has a, a very good ovarian function. And uh, so if you just don't use, uh, uh, as you said earlier, five thousand dollars a medication to produce 20 or 30 follicles, and uh, because those patients uh, don't need uh, that many eggs to resolve pregnancy. And uh, so if those patients with just a tubal disease or male factor infertility, 35 years old, and I think four, four eggs, that's all need to uh, get her pregnant. So if that's the case, why get 20 or 30 eggs? So that's another category of patients can be try the minimum stimulation. Another category of patient is a patient with a uh, same-sex couple, and those individuals have no fertility problem at all. So those are the patients, uh, there's no reproductive issue, and it's just because of sexual orientation. So those individuals, and it can be very easy to depend on how many uh, children do they wish to have, and uh, using minimum stimulation is a very good option for those individuals. You don't need to produce, uh, again, uh, 10 to 15 embryos for them to uh, have uh, one baby. And another uh, last category, I think minimum stimulation would be good for them, is just, uh, or individual and who has a specific religious belief and that they don't want to have freeze embryos. And for those individuals, you probably use natural IVF and just uh, uh, if they just want wish to have one child and they just take a, one egg out and they make one embryo and get them pregnant. And uh, uh, if they wish to, uh, so I think this is a, a three category in addition to top of uh, uh, other two category patients, I think uh, would be applied for minimum stimulation IVF. Thank you so much. Well, your practice is known for low steam flow protocol. Um, do you use sometimes more more stimulation or higher dose in certain patients, or you, or, or is across all patients? Oh, it depends. It depends on patient uh, condition. And uh, although uh, minimum stimulation is a uh, major of the option we we offer, and uh, so we do have patient that also doing natural IVF, and also we do modify the conventional IVF, which is uh, use a much lower dose, maybe about one third of dose medication and for compared conventional for those individuals, depends on the needs. So for example, if uh, a 40 years old woman and uh, so she has a good ovarian reserve and uh, so for those individuals wish to have a two, two or three children and so, so I would like to use a little bit more uh, high dose medication. So in my standard high dose, which means uh, maybe just a 150 or the 225, not as a 450 or 600. So I think that's yeah. uh, people's definition is a little bit different. Very good, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, um, natural uh, cycle, or natural IVF cycle, what, uh, Dr. Karman, what's your experience with that? And what kind of patient would you recommend that treatment for? Uh, I think the natural cycle IVF is something that uh, I don't typically recommend in my practice. And I'll, I'll kind of explain um, a little bit about that. I think it has to do with um, where I am geographically and um, 
the insurance mandates here, but um, I, I suppose that somebody who has a low variant reserve, again, same, same, same situation that we discussed, somebody who has a low variant reserve um, and you know, I can give them lots of medication and get one egg, um, or uh, I can give them no medication and also get that same egg. Obviously, it's much more reasonable to just you know, not give them medication and get that one egg. I don't typically um, recommend that, although I do it uh, for patients who strongly desire it and understand. Um, in Hawaii, of course, we have an insurance mandate which requires um, all insurers to cover uh, at least one IVF cycle here. Um, there is a lot of pressure on, you know, patients and physicians here um, to have them achieve a pregnancy with one cycle, and that basically means one egg retrieval. Um, and so these are patients who we've got to do everything we possibly can to really, really increase that cumulative pregnancy rate for them with that, you know, with that one uh, egg retrieval that we do. And so if I give them medication and get two eggs instead of natural cycle, just getting one egg like that, <laughs> that, that could potentially mean the difference between them um, being able to have a baby or not, because for many of the patients due to the insurance mandate, you know, they're able to do that one, but then a second cycle is not affordable for them. Um, I think that, again, if I was elsewhere where patients were um, typically paying out of pocket where things were structured a little bit differently, then perhaps um, uh, we, would, we would do things differently. But just given the fact that we only have that one shot, um, I don't do natural cycles a whole lot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Deng? Yeah, uh, so uh, natural cycle uh, IVF, we don't do that many um, as well, but I do think some patient specific population would potentially benefit. For example, if the patient is, let's say, age 44, 45, and the severe um, uh, poor responders, like uh, from prior, no matter it's a conventional or like a COMED with um, a minimal stimulation cycle, they can only get one or two eggs or like their uh, AMH level is less than 0 0.1. And by monitoring their cycles, okay, so we still see they have spontaneous uh, one follicle growth like in one month. And the patient declined like uh, are not ready for the donor's uh, egg. And the, if they really wanted to try to uh, achieve the egg, and I think potentially we can do natural IVF. Uh, but I think if the patient is willing to try Clomid um, and uh, their FSH level is not like a sky high, I think we probably will still uh, trying to put them on the Clomid uh, or minimal stimulation instead of a natu natural IVF. Um, but I think it, it depends on uh, the patient's situation. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Escobar? I frankly don't do much of natural um, cycle IVF uh, for the same reasons we mentioned before. Um, I think it's all about the counseling. I think most patients um, want to get the most out of an egg retrieval and even most people can afford, you know, even if you give them 150 for 10 or 12 or 13 days, they can afford that, you know, and, and you could totally get several eggs like that. Um, I, I, you know, there's, there's risks with an egg retrieval, there's the increased cost. And so I would really spend a lot of time with the patient if that's, um, if they really wanted that and understanding really the reasons, if there were religious reasons or that's because, you know, whatever, that's, it's just about counseling the patient, but obviously you're going to get either zero or none. Having said that. I do think that patients that are already very DOR with really diminished and reserve tend sometimes to recruit two or three eggs a month because their FSH is so high. So, um, so it's, I mean, it's just like anything else, you know, but it's, it's, they're more frustrating. Also, you're not going to put in birth control pills to show you those patients. So the timing of the retrieval and everything else becomes a little bit more difficult to manage. Um, so we do very, very little of that. It, it, it's got to be just the right patient. But most people are open to taking medications. Most people have taken Clomid and Lidrosol before. They've done IUIs before they moved into IVF. So um, 
it's, 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 I think usually if that comes into play is because they've read about it. Or there's, there's something they have to, there's religious or some belief of, of not taking medications. Those patients are rare in Texas. Yeah, thank you so much. Dr. Yeria? Yes, I agree. And I think Dr. Dan uh, mentioned about the uh, patient for advanced maternal age and for women 43, 44, 45. Uh, years of age, and uh, those individuals has uh, a low ovarian reserve, and uh, also uh, for those individuals, they don't want to give up for the uh, try to using donor egg, and uh, those individuals would be considered as a, uh, the uh, natural IVF as an option. And I just give you an example. And I have a patient who uh, came all the way from the UK, and the patient is 40 years old, and her AMH level is 0 0.01, and the average level vary between 20 to 24 and the most cycle only have one follicle. So the physician from the UK and they told her and the only chance you want to be successful using donor egg, and the, but she did not give up using donor egg. And she flew all the way from UK and they come to our center. And the, so as you all know, the woman uh, average about 20 to 24. And the, uh, for those individuals, if you give uh, donor egg 250, uh, uh, this is uh, almost suicidal. And so there's no way you can get a follicle grow. And uh, so I decided to use a natural cycle idea for her. So she flew the three trips and the flew from UK here and the three times and uh, each cycle we get a one egg. We made the three embryos and all the three embryos go to blastest. We tested the PGS and the two out of three are PGS normal. And the first embryo transfer results live birth. Now she still have one more embryo for transfer, waiting for her transfer. So this patient that uh, I think a natural idea is the best option for her to have. That's excellent, very good. Uh, we have a patient that wanted to ask a question live. Uh, Shalini, are you there? Yes. Very good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Excellent. Uh, please ask a question. Hi. Uh, so I'd like to give a little bit of background before I get to my questions. Um, sure. So sure. I am 32 years old and my BMI is 23. And I was diagnosed with low ovarian reserve. So I, my AMH was... Um, 0.66 as of December 2019, and my AFC count was 10, um, 8 on the right and 2 on the left. Um, so I've tried a few treatments. I've tried the IUI, um, but my husband has a male factor infertility issue, so it didn't work. Then I tried three IVF cycles. The first one was a natural IVF cycle, and um, so, I mean, it's not completely natural because they did use the stims. Uh, so I just, they directly used this, um, you know, the uh, stim medications on my day two uh, of my cycle. And I did not use any uh, agonist or antagonist bef um, before the stims. So it was, uh, and then what happened was that resulted in a dominant follicle on my first follicular scan. So this was converted to an IUI. And my second IVF cycle, uh, we used the, we did the conventional protocol, which uh, which was uh, 21 days of birth control pills, uh, followed by Lupron and the stim medications. And the dosage of those medications were also the max dose. So I was given menopore of uh, 150 and gonal of 375. So um, that resulted in three, I got three eggs out of which one uh, matured and it fertilized. We got a really good embryo, uh, which reached the uh, day five blastocyst. However, that turned out to be an aneuploid. It was trisomy 15 aneuploid embryo. So we couldn't really, we were not sure if uh, we could implant it or should we like, uh, we were not sure about the accuracy of the PGTA testing. Um, so we just kept that on the side. It's just frozen. Um, and we tried another IVF cycle, which was exactly the same as uh, it was the conventional protocol. The only difference was the birth control pill duration was 24 days. And we didn't get any egg in the third uh, IVF cycle. We just, I mean, we, we got one egg. It was immature, so we couldn't fertilize it. So, so this is what the feedback I got from my doctor. So he, he thinks that I was overly suppressed um, in the last two conventional protocols. And he thought I, I had absolutely no suppression in the first natural cycle protocol. So he decided to do a mini stim that was, uh, that's Clomid, Cetratide, and the stimulation medication. This, 
system medications. So my question is, um, I want to know if this would be suitable for somebody like me, um, based on my background. Would would this really work for me? Um, I will start with uh, you, Dr. Escobar. Uh, yeah, so I, I think, I think um, first of all, I think you're very young. And that's, uh, there's two many same patients, right? They don't diminish their every service. The older patient, the young patient, the young patients tend to have always, most of the time, a happy ending, you know, and, and walk out with a baby. So even getting one egg out or two eggs out um, really gives you a very good prognosis. Um, there is, I agree that I, I would not give my mini steam patients that much uh, birth control pills. I try to keep it less than a week and a half, maximum two weeks, actually just a week to week and a half. Uh, patients do get really suppressed and it makes it much uh, worse. Um, your AFC, I don't know how much I believe it. Um, um, when I first saw that, I, was, I would not call that DOR. Your, my AMH probably in your age group, but ultimately how you responded was like a DOR patient. Um, I've had patients in the past, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to, um, have the exact reasons, I'm not gonna say why, but, but uh, some patients just respond great to Comet, you know, like some patients you can give 600 IUs of gonadotropins and they just won't respond. And, you just add some some clomid and they, they do beautifully and and so um so i i think um you're like in my book the perfect uh mini stim patient for what in my practice we call mini stim because obviously what i would say to you is like the chances that you're going to work out with what you need with a single cycle because what i had explained before what we call mini stim you know our mini stim protocol is it's two retrievals we don't have to do the two retrievals but is there are patients who will predict they're going to need two retrievals and that would definitely be you um so so yeah you're totally qualified uh, in, in in our mini stim protocol okay thank you so much thank you so much uh, dr yelian what's your comments on this so I think I agree. I think uh, this would be a uh, minimum steroid should be a good option for her. And then also, uh, I'll probably, on top of that, for that individual, I probably would not use any suppression at all. I don't want to do priming, no birth control pill, or no estrogen priming. I mean, just let her natural, natural follicle uh, grow. And uh, if we can, we can uh, using just the natural cycle uh, resolve, uh, resolve the if, and the, with the minimum stimulation, she has a good response, has a, a synchronized other follicle. Uh, that is uh, uh, would be good for her. But if uh, she has uh, uh, developed dominant follicle, and uh, so you can have options uh, just uh, using loop point trigger and get dominant follicle first, and then you continue using called dual stimulation and you use, continue use medication and uh, for the second wave, and uh, uh, some people call it luteal phase stimulation, you can get another uh, four to five eggs. And so that will be help her to minimize of the risk of only one egg for the one per cycle. Thank you so much. Dr. Ding? Yeah, I think like uh, you are one of those uh, uh, women actually can, I think can benefit from minimal stimulation. First of all, as Dr. Escobar mentioned, you're very young. So your age actually is on your side. So provide you a good chance to get pregnant. Although your AMH level is 0 0.6, that does not define uh, whether you're fertile or non-fertile. And uh, at age 32, the chance you have a uh, chromosome normal egg, this is probably about 70 to 80 percent. So if we can achieve like three to four uh, eggs from one retrieval cycle, and uh, you will have a good chance to get pregnant. And also I think you, uh, in your previous um, uh, treatment, uh, probably yeah, uh, those are birth control pills using for three to four weeks to suppress your endogenous FSH. So if I'm uh, uh, planning the treatment for you, I will like think you're a good candidate for Clomid plus uh, uh, 75 to 150 units of uh, uh, Manicure. We can use daily or once every other day. And we can potentially add antagonist when the leading follicle is around like a 12 to 14 millimeter and try to um, achieve, hopefully we can get a three to five X. And uh, in, at your age, if your lining looks good, you can potentially have fresh embryo transfer and uh, try to get pregnant, uh, go from there. And I agree with Dr. Yelin, I would not add uh, any uh, priming birth control or estrogen to suppress uh, before we start them. 
Okay. question. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Kamon? Um, so I guess my opinion is a little bit different than the others, and um, I think you can go either way. I agree with your physician that you were probably oversuppressed. I think three weeks of birth control pills is a lot for somebody who um, has a lower AMH and has not responded well in the, you know, in the past. I think that um, given the fact that you are, you did recruit a very early follicle, I think that your doctor um, was trying to prevent that from happening by then putting you on a longer course of control, and that's where that does make sense. Um, I think a happy medium, though, would be in, um, to do uh, a luteal estrogen protocol, essentially starting semesterase in the luteal phase um, and overlapping that with gonadotropins that provides just a little bit of suppression um, to suppress that initial kind of dominant follicle, um, and, but then typically does not uh, over suppress the ovaries too much. Um, and then, you know, it's sort of like a minimal stimulation kind of talk. So everyone's gearing towards, you know, minimal or, or, or conventional stimulation, but certainly there are other things to consider and other changes in protocol that can be considered. Um, uh, things like adding Clomid, things like considering um, priming with testosterone or um, things like growth hormone. Uh, these are all things which, you know, in the literature um, have been suggested as, as, as adjuncts for some patients with lower ovarian risk. So I don't necessarily think it's just a question of gonadotropin dosing, um, especially because with an antral follicle count of 10, you know, I agree with Dr. Escobar. I mean, I think that's unusual that you kind of were getting, you know, if you had it, you have a great antral follicle count essentially and not, you know, so if that's really the case, we should try to figure out how we can, I think, try and recruit those and get those 10 eggs from you. And, and you know, maybe that does require um, some additional therapies um, and changes in your protocol. Thank you so much. That's, that's great. Uh, we had the, an, another patient live that wanted to ask a question. Uh, uh, Marijana, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. So um, I have a question for your experts. I'm just going to give you a little bit of the background. I'm 42 years old female, and this is actually second pregnancy attempt. First pregnancy was spontaneous two years ago, and uh, it resulted with a live birth with a cesarean section. My AMH level is 2.05, and the FSH is 6.3. I went through the two cycles of IVF with the following protocol. Menopure two times a day, 150 milligrams, and gone out uh, two times a day, uh, 150 milligrams. So in total, 300 uh, milligrams per day of both of these uh, medicines. Uh, results from the first retrieval, I had actually 19 eggs retrieved, all were fertilized, five embryos reached the blastocyst stage. Uh, however, none of them uh, passed the uh, biopsy. The second results uh, from the second retrieval was 18 eggs retrieved, 12 eggs fertilized, seven embryos sent for the uh, biopsy, none of them uh, passed the, the, the biopsy. So my question to, to, to you all is, if you would actually suggest me any other protocol, maybe a lower stimulation, because I was reading a lot about actually that that might be the option. So I'm asking experts for their opinion. Uh, just to clarify your question, so when you say seven uh, did not pass biopsy, are these, uh, uh, did it reached the stage of blast, but they were chromosomally abnormal? That's correct. So in the, in the second cycle, there were seven of them, and in the first cycle, five. So in essence, uh, 12 embryos were sent for the analysis, but I don't have any one that is good for transfer. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Yilian, would you like to respond first? I think that uh, she does not have a good luck, and that's because it is a probability. And uh, for a woman at age 42, her chance of uh, embryo to be chromosome normal is probably one in four to one in six. So that's what we did a study, and uh, we analyzed about 1,800 embryos and then in our practice. And uh, uh, at her age group, 42, and it should be one in four to one in six to be PGS normal. So unfortunately, she has seven uh, abnormal, and it's just uh, uh, my suggestion to try again. And I can give you an example. I had a patient that uh, the reason I say the lucky is because uh, uh, doing IVF treatment, and you need to find a good doctor and a good embryologist, a good practice. But at the same time, you need a good luck as well. 
I have two patients, and they're both 45 years old. And one she came to me, and uh, one patient, and we, I told her at age 45, your chance of MV to become normal is less than one in 10. So she said, let's go for, for it. So we did a egg retrieval for the patient. We did a three, it's called a mini IVF cycle for her. And we actually, her uh, ovarian function not so good. And after three cycles, she only had a one embryo. But the embryo was not so good. It was like a four CD. And uh, we tested, embryo was normal, was normal embryo. And uh, so she was so lucky. And uh, uh, the embryo transfer result of pregnancy when she did a baby, she was 46. Another patient, same of 45, and uh, so, uh, we did a nine egg retrieval cycles and the bank is 14 embryos. And uh, after 14, because she said, I'm easy quick. If I have one embryo test abnormal, I'll quit. But she was asking for banking embryos. So we banked the 14 embryos for her and after egg, nine mini IVF egg cycles and uh, tested, came back one normal, the normal one from her very last egg retrieval. And the transfer again, also pregnant, had a baby at the 46. So those two cases I give you example is because of, uh, uh, I think purely probability, uh, lucky and uh, lucky involved. And I think the first patient was so lucky and the second patient was not so lucky. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Deng, uh, uh, you, you, no, we see that AMH is quite high for her age, right? Uh, yeah. 2.05. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, and the number of eggs also is Pretty high. So, what do you? Why do you think she's not getting uh, uh, embryos? And what is there any stimulation protocol that would she would be benefiting from? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, her AMH level and the number of eggs she achieved actually, I would say, uh, are way better than most women uh, with the same age. And uh, uh, no matter we're using minimal stimulation protocol or conventional IVF protocol, those is, protocols would not reverse or change uh, the proportion of uh, chromosome of normal X in that a group of uh, X she get. It's just like the physiology. We're unfortunately, we're not able to uh, like uh, decrease the aneuploidy rate, no matter mm -hmm. which stimulation protocol we're using. In her case, I think um, with her, she got a good response. Uh, she achieved a 19 and 18 X and uh, uh, from each cycle, she got like five and a seven blastocyst. Actually, it's, those outcomes are not bad at all, I would say. If you calculate what's a blastocyst formation rate uh, for her age 42. And I think uh, if, uh, just as Dr. Yilin say, um, some people are first time winner. You know, even if they get only one egg, if that egg uh, happened to be the euploid embryo, then people can get pregnant with the first try. But some people, they just need like a two or three or more cycles to get that egg that is uh, 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 like normal and uh, will develop into the live birth. And I think in her case, if I do, uh, I would recommend to try another cycle. And I would uh, still use the, probably use the same stimulation protocol as what she had, because she had a good response, good number of eggs, good blastocyst formation. I think I agree, she just needs a little bit luck to, uh, to get to that normal embryo. Uh, that would be my uh, recommendation. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Carmon, is this just a matter of uh, numbers? Because we know the UPOD rate is probably fifteen percent or so. I think what? it's just a, I, I think it's just a matter of numbers. Um, you know, I I wish there was a different, you know, maybe a fancier answer. But um, like I always explain this to my patients in this way, I say that um, having a boy child or a girl child is supposed to be fifty fifty. So. I know all these people who have like five girls. I mean, how does that happen, right? It's just, it's just kind of um, luck of the draw. And unfortunately at 42, um, you're, you just have to go through more eggs, um, you know, and, and you, in that sense, you need a little bit more luck than, than if you're younger. Um, but, you know, even in young patients, sometimes we see that, you know, unexpectedly high aneuploidy rates in one cycle, the next cycle, everything looks fine. Um, I do think it's a matter of probabilities. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Escobar, would you recommend for the patient to look at translocations and other things that may be increasing that rate of abnormality? Because when you look at 12X and no, no normal, is that a possibility? And would simulation protocol be the solution for that? 
So I, um, that, I agree 100%. I think, especially if there's a, a single chromosome that repeated itself, you know, the aneuploidies, then I think that that would make me think of that. I would order parental karyotypes, the chromosome analysis. If they're just all over the place, then probably not necessarily. Um, but if they're very anxious and they want to do it, they can do it. It's expensive. It takes a month to get it back. Um, I just a lot of things in fertility are in threes and it's probably statistics it's just your chances to get pregnant with the first IUI and the third IUI are the same and um, IVF is not much different um, not too many people get to do that many IVF cycles but I remember reading a, an article years ago that basically the predictability of a failed IVF cycle um, basically occurs after you've had like a third failed cycle. I'm not encouraging people to keep doing IVF cycles, but as people mentioned before, there's a lot of uh, good and bad luck. And I'll tell you, I just have a patient uh, that is a wife of uh, OBGYN locally. And first cycle, we got one um, one embryo, see, like one embryo and uh, it was unemployed. The second cycle, a Houston cycle, uh, we got uh, six embryos and um, five were normal. And so my first cycle was a normal high dose stimulation, like uh, 450 I used. And the second one was just one of my, um, uh, just what we call mini-stim with Clomid. Um, I don't know that releasing your own gonadotropins out of your pituitary plus whatever else, whatever else is leaked out of the pituitary makes a difference. I don't know if gut constellation is different in those versus, um, as, as you guys know, like FSH is made in, I think, hamster ovarian cells in the lab that are transfected, and I think Menopure comes from the urine of nuns in Argentina. So I just don't know if releasing your own gonotropins makes a difference. Uh, I don't know if that's what you're getting at. Um, but from, from, from my own personal experience, I do think that um, these patients, the way we stimulate them, tend to get really good euploid Embryos, but that's not her problem because she's actually has a high of reserve for her age. And I think she's just very unlucky. So, so if the genetics are cut to the side and, and then the patient to have the physician, well, we're going to do exactly the same thing. So then I would, if you're not already on it, I would definitely put you on CoQ10, um, at least six or 800 milligrams for about three months. And that I would put your husband on antioxidants. I would probably turn on with the idea of Zymont, which kind of filters the sperm, and you may be able to have better sperm into the mix. Um, and I do think we all have there's the statistics that are very frustrating in your case because you they failed you. And then there's just anecdotal evidence. I mean, I have I've had egg donors that are 25 years old producing eight egg embryos and one euploid, and then I have a 47 year old with euploid embryos. And so so we all have these, these anecdotal um, uh, uh, cases that are just not very helpful, I think. I think they can give you hope. You can overly give hope to a patient. Uh, but also the statistics that we've been taught to be more like the standard of care, or kind of the way we should educate our patients, can help some people like, like yourself. So that's kind of my take on it. Thank you so much. Um, Marijana and Shalini, thank you so much for asking the live questions. Um, now we're going to go to another question that was asked, submitted to our panel. Uh, Miriam, do you have that question? Yes, I do. Um, so our patient Nancy asks, she says that she has a low AMH of 0 0.4 and that she's 34 years old with endometriosis. Uh, she had conventional IVF cycle performed last month. Uh, she retrieved four eggs and was on Menopure and Androgel. And then two fertilized and both stopped growing by day three. She said, my doctor thinks failed cycle was mainly due to poor egg quality. He suggested to have a mini IVF for the next cycle. Uh, my question is, could it be the small qu quantity of egg retrieved to determine the egg quality? And how bad my endometriosis could hurt my eggs, or is it mainly my age? And then also, will you recommend doing mini IVF? Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Deng? Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for asking this question. Uh, I think uh, for the endometriosis, um, there's some, there was some data actually suggesting uh, 
when they uh, transfer the embryo derived from the eggs of the endometriosis patient to the surrogate, uh, that pregnancy rate actually is similar to those patients who does not have endometriosis. So I think like the data suggesting endometriosis itself probably did not significantly impact the egg quality. Um, however, she had um, four eggs and uh, two fertilized and all arrested at day three. So I probably would um, uh, dig a little bit more about like a, how the endometriosis was diagnosed. And uh, um, does she have any symptoms or not? Any endometrioma, like on the ovaries, looks like an AMH 0 0.4 for age 34 is uh, uh, lower for her age. And uh, but the good thing is that she's less than age 35. She still have a uh, chance, a good chance, a decent chance to get pregnant if we can get uh, a good quality embryo. Um, um, from the stimulation. I think she can potentially benefit from a minimal stimulation, which uh, use like less um, exogenous gonadotropins. And uh, before that though, I would say uh, probably look at her picture to see if, w does she need like a depolupron to kind of suppress uh, her endometriosis if she has active disease, is she symptomatic? And uh, sometimes letrozole might be able to help as well to suppress uh, some inflammatory change uh, that is associated with endometriosis. Otherwise, I would say with MH 0.4 and 4X retrieved last cycle, uh, she could be a, a candidate with a minimal stimulation. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Kaman, is, um, you know, patients who have endometriosis, is it typical to see a quality issue with those patients? And what would you recommend in this case? Yeah, I, um, we do see that quite a bit. Again, and I do agree that there's there's a lot, a lot of issues with endometriosis because there can also be, uh, there's obviously an issue with implantation as well. Um, and so uh, in addition to that, there can be adenomyosis, undiagnosed adenomyosis, which presents a whole other problem. Um, many patients with endometriosis also will have a history of endometriomas or removal of endometriomas, which we know will um, can damage underlying ovarian reserve, which is why typically we're not just routinely removing endometriomas now prior to, um, prior to IVF. So I think that there's, there are a lot of issues with endometriosis. Um, uh, and it's, it's one of the harder things, I think, to, to treat. Um, at least fertility wise. Um, in terms of, you know, your age of 34, I think that, um, again, that, that's, that's a, the best prognostic indicator. I always tell my patients that the best uh, test for success is age, no matter what. Um, we expect that we're not going to be able to get a whole lot of eggs. We probably can't do anything with the protocol to get 30 eggs. You know, we're probably going to um, be on the lower end of of things just given uh, your AMH and your previous cycle. Um, I think minimal stimulation can be reasonable, again, for a number of reasons, one of them being that um, if you used a high dose and still only got four eggs, again, we can expect something similar with using lower doses, um, and that's going to be less expensive and, um, and perhaps provide just as many eggs for you. Um, but we also should consider all the other factors um, that were mentioned before. So I'd have to kind of look into the whole picture. Uh, does suppression, is suppression of endometriosis a little bit more warranted? Should we be adding letrozole to this protocol? Um, should we be using um, some kind of pretreatment for a few months prior to CoQ10 and um, the growth hormone, you know, the sort of types of things that we may use in people who are lower responders. So again, I just will say it's not just a question of, of dosing. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Yilian, what's your interpretation of this case and what's your recommendation? So if this is my patient and I will be offer her natural IVF because this patient be a perfect candidate for natural IVF and it's very simple and this is your uh, feel the conventional and they use a uh, high dose medication only for egg and only two embryo and for the embryo not in good quality. So for those patients and uh, 
she's young and the, her chance of embryo to be close to normal is a two out of three. So I think in this patient, you either choosing natural cycle, fresh embryo transfer or uh, natural cycle IVF uh, frozen embryo transfer. I think it should be a good candidate. Obviously, mini IVF is also an option. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Escobar, what's your approach to cases like this? These are very difficult cases. Um, again, you know, yeah, I agree with the comment I was made before about, uh, I think Dr. Deng brought it up about the endometriosis and surrogates, and some people have uh, looked back at ASRM data, uh, SAR data, and, and it's very frustrating because most of the studies really don't show there's much difference in uh, the quality of these eggs and embryos and so forth in endometriosis patients. But I, I feel that what I see in clinical practice in bad patients like her is different than that. And I do think there's patients that probably have this high inflammatory milieu there that is just not good for eggs. Obviously, if they smoke, if they have other things, that's just gonna make it worse. Um, um, you can prep them, like we said, with CoQ10. Um, I've seen patients who've been overly suppressed because they have endometriosis and they've taken years and years of continuous norethindrone acetate or birth control. And that becomes very challenging and they do need quite a break. But also there's something to say, like Dr. Deng was saying about having to just all this inflammation from, from uh, the endometriosis. So something that I do easily, I, try, I get a CA125 level Sometimes in these patients, it will be elevated. Um, and so it kind of becomes then if they're lucky enough to have it elevated, a good marker to treat them for a couple of months with uh, Lupron or, or Letrozole or a progestin and see if it comes down. And so it's kind of like a way to say, okay, I've, I've reduced the endometriosis, then give the patient a break. Uh, so they're not uh, suppressed, the HPT access, uh, HPO access is no, uh, not too suppressed. And then I would stimulate them. And I definitely think this would be a perfect means to patient. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we are coming close to the end of the webinar. Uh, I would like to give you guys a minute to introduce your practice and tell us what you do for patients. Uh, and I will start with you, uh, Dr. Carmon. Okay, well, um, thanks for, for letting me introduce myself. So I'm a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist at the Fertility Institute of Hawaii in private practice here. And uh, we take care of the, the gamut of patients um, ranging from um, kind of routine uh, infertility treatment to more complex cases, medical and surgical reproductive endocrinology issues. Um, and uh, we practice in an environment, like I mentioned, where insurance does cover uh, one round of in vitro fertilization typically. And so um, we are usually doing a conventional approach in that case. If a patient is unsuccessful with that approach, um, then we move on to, to other types of protocols and other things. And um, sometimes minimal stimulation, mini stim, natural cycles are approaches that we'll consider uh, intravaginal incubators things like that too. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Yelian? Yes, uh, Frankie Yelian from uh, Life IVF Center. I'm a medical director and the founder of uh, Life IVF Center. And all center focus on the precision IVF. So uh, when I say precision IVF, it's like a precision medicine. And so we are uh, based on the patient's uh, age mm -hmm. and her fertility goal and uh, also her medical uh, ovarian function. And we based on our patient age and all the factors considered and determine and design a special protocol tailored for the patient and then determine how many eggs we retrieve for this individual and how many ambi we try to make and how many baby we can make uh, get, uh, help her to achieve. So that's the, we are different than most of the centers. Thank you so much. Dr. Ding. Hi, uh, thank you for letting me introduce myself. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist and an infertility fellow at Stanford. So in our practice, we uh, take care of um, uh, uh, a broad uh, spectrum of uh, infertility patients. And uh, um, our age, like a uh, population, um, like range from like a, a 21 or uh, even younger for, for example, those transgender patient up to like 47. And also we do, uh, besides the routine IVF uh, management, we do a lot of uh, fertility preservation, egg freezing, embryo banking for 
um, general population, but also for oncology patient, uh, transgender patient, as I mentioned, we uh, offer third party treatment um, to uh, LBGTQ group. And also we do a lot of uh, research, clinical research, and we uh, have several research projects going on right now. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, just, a, uh, we have a group of uh, um, several, uh, six to seven physicians and uh, several fellows. It's, uh, we're actively uh, uh, involved the, the patient care and uh, try our best to uh, provide a really personalized individual uh, management. Thank you so much. Dr. Escobar. Thank you so much for the invitation. I, I thought I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I'm in Dallas, Texas. Uh, our practice is called Conceive Fertility Center. And um, we're a group of physicians who basically left all the other practice we were at and we just kind of want to practice a little bit differently. Uh, we um, really kind of pamper our patients. I'm not saying that people don't care for their patients, but it's, um, I think our focus is personalized care. We basically do all the sonograms ourselves, very little ancillary stuff. We're able to handle very difficult and challenging cases. A lot of our patients um, are older patients, um, people who fail cycles elsewhere, elsewhere uh, different parts of the country. People come from other parts of uh, just either in other, or even other countries. Um, and, and so I think it's that personalized care that allows us to take care of, uh, of these patients that just don't fit the cookie cutter, this IVF that a lot of uh, people find in, in, in other practices. Um, so a lot of our patients are north of 40, 45. I mean, it's, I, I, I'd hate to say a limit because it's, it's, it's the, one, one, the one time you have a limit, you, you kind of uh, break it yourself. Um, my kids are behind there. They're IVF kids. They're, um, they're not egg surrogacy children. So I've had gone through it myself. And I think because of that, that part of the practice has really grown. And we have a lot of people who who also come just for the third party, the donor egg and the surrogacy. So, thank you so much. Fun practice. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, uh, with this, we are coming to the end of the webinar. Next week, we will have another webinar on a different topic. We will update you with the title and participants. This Saturday, we will have a symposium. It's gonna be the first symposium on recent advances in embryology and reproductive genetics. And we will start the symposium at 9 a.m. It will take about four hours. So stay tuned and I will see you on Saturday. Thank you so much. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.